watch this at night. Hey curious cats, my name is Sahara. Welcome to that true crime channel. Let's get into it. Before we actually get into this video, there's two things I need to tell you. The first thing is that this case is extremely extremely graphic what i'm gonna say the description of events and i'm also gonna be showing a couple of pictures the first time i heard about this case it actually gave me nightmares it's pretty similar to the hello kitty murder case if you are familiar with that one it's a case that happened in hong kong about 10 years after this one that i'm going to be talking about the first time i heard about a murder case that was this graphic and gruesome was the uh, Sylvia Likens case and I wanted to cover this story. I'm definitely going to be doing it in the future, not in the near future because I think I'm going to be needing at least a couple weeks um, or maybe a couple months to recover from this one. If you're sensitive, I highly suggest, I mean you can still watch the video but you can skip the uh, torture chapter and you know now in the timeline of YouTube videos you have chapter names and I'm definitely going to be including that and I'm also going to be giving you a warning before I actually get into that chapter so you just don't need to check every second that you're you know in the timeline that you're getting to that chapter I'll be giving you a warning beforehand the second thing I want to say is that I'll be including clips from a documentary that is entirely in Japanese. It had no subtitles and I couldn't find a translation. You know, YouTube has this auto translate feature, but it's not accurate. I would say about 20 to 30% of the translation was accurate and made sense. I really, really wanted to include footage from this documentary because it was made shortly after this tragedy. Some parts of the documentary I was able to understand by myself and I will be including them throughout this video. And because this case is so old, every time that I saw anything about it on YouTube or any articles that I read, it had very little footage and usually it's always, you know, the same pictures. I'm obviously going to be showing the same pictures, but I really wanted to have something extra in my video, something I didn't find in other videos. Junko Furuta was born on January 18th, 1971 in Misato, Japan. It's a city located in the northern suburbs of Tokyo. She has an older brother and a younger brother and they all live with their parents in Misato. Junko is a very bright student. She never misses class in three years. She missed like two or three days of school. She's liked by fellow classmates, by teachers, by pretty much everybody. She was also working part-time and she was saving up money for a trip that she was planning to take after she graduated and she would also help out her parents with the money she made. So she was working part-time in a plastic molding factory and she was looking for a a full-time job for after she graduated and she found one at an electronics retailer. So Junko was this beautiful young woman, she was a bright student, she was the child every parent dreamed of having. She didn't smoke, she didn't do drugs as a lot of teenagers do. She'd come straight home after school or after work, she'd help around the house, she helped with money, she was just a perfect teenager. And because Junko was so pretty, a lot of boys had a crush on her, including Hiroshi Miyano, a teenage boy from her school. Supposedly he was interested in her and he asked her out on multiple occasions but she politely declined every time. He was a bully apparently so even if she had been looking to date someone she probably would not have picked him anyway. But Miyano had a plan, a very twisted plan. One day Junko was getting out of work and heading home and she had this bicycle that she used to get around. In this clip the reporter is showing the area, showing the pole where she used to uh, secure her bike and she's explaining that her workplace was about a 20 to 30 minute bike ride from Junko's house, from her house. And here she's interviewing a witness and this witness is describing the bike. She's saying that it was still attached here on this pole and the reporter is asking her if she heard something like screams or anything because what happened was Junko was attacked in that spot. On November 25th, 1998, Miyano asked one of his friends, Minato, to attack Junko while she was getting to her bike. His friend obliged and then Miyano came to the rescue, kind of like Prince Charming rescuing a damsel in distress. 
you would think that he wanted her to fall in love with him had it been the case, had she really been a damsel in distress. But his motive behind this was to gain her trust. She's in a moment when she's vulnerable, she's scared, someone just attacked her, and this guy comes to offer help, so most likely she assumed that his intentions were good. He actually pretended to Junko that this guy attacked him once with a knife. He was dangerous and he could come back, so he offered to walk her back to her home. So obviously she would feel safer being in the company of another man if this guy came back to attack her again. But instead of walking her home, he took her to a warehouse that was not too far from where he saved her. I actually did wonder why she followed him to that warehouse. My first theory was that either it was on their way, but I still wondered why she went inside. And my other theory was that maybe he pretended that this would be a safer route. Once they got to that warehouse, he actually raped her and he threatened her. He told her that he was linked to the Yakuza's, the Japanese mafia, and that was actually true. So he said to her, don't scream, do as I say, or you're dead. After that, he took her to a hotel and he raped her again. At which point, he called some friends and they got there. And to Junko's surprise, one of them was actually the attacker. They found out where she lived when they were going through her stuff in her bag. She was carrying a bag, as most women do, and in her possessions she had her address written somewhere, I think in a notebook or something. So they were like, now we know where you live, if you scream or if you don't do as we say, we will kill you and your entire family. At that point, she's surrounded by four boys, one has raped her twice already, and he is connected to the Yakuza. And I'm guessing it's something she already knew, because that boy was from her school, and he would often bully others and tell them that he was a Yakuza member. So everybody in the school pretty much knew, so I'm sure that she knew herself as well. So she's surrounded by these four boys, she's threatened to be killed, threatened to have her family killed, she just had no way to escape. Then they took her to Minato's house, the attacker, and if you think being raped was bad, it's far from being the worst thing that was going to happen to Junko. This is the chapter that is gonna make you throw up and have nightmares, so please, if you're too sensitive, again, just skip that chapter and go to the next one. When the boys got to Minato's house with Junko, they pretended that she was the girlfriend of one of them, just so that his parents wouldn't ask any questions or suspect anything. After a few days of being held captive in Minato's house, the boys had the brilliant idea to have Junko call her own parents and tell them that she had run away, she had not gone missing. Please don't look for me, I'm safe, I'm just staying with friends. I think the boys found out that Junko's parents had called the police and they had two days after she had not come home from work because when she was over the phone they made sure that she told them to stop the search. So I'm pretty sure they knew. But even if they didn't, I think they just wanted to make sure that there would be no search and no investigation going on. While Junko was in that house, here's what happened to her. She was raped by all four boys over 400 times. They also invited their Yakuza friends to rape her, uh, their school friends to rape her. In total, about 100 men participated in raping her and torturing her. So she was raped a total of about 500 times, but 400 of these times were just these four boys. They would force her to masturbate in front of them. They would insert objects in her anus and vagina, like a lit light bulb, so obviously very hot, fireworks that they would light up, a uh, soda bottle made of glass, meat skewers that were still hot, they pierced her breasts with sewing needles, and one of her nipples was actually completely torn off with pliers. They burned her with cigarettes and lighters. They burned her clitoris and the inside of her vagina. They would beat her while she was forced to sing and dance and keep singing and dancing despite the beating. They would lie her down on the floor and in turn they would stomp on her head, like jump on her head. They would hunk her from the ceiling and use her as a punching bag. They would drop um, barbells on her stomach. They starved her and forced her to eat live cockroaches. They forced her to drink her own urine. Most of the time she was required to stay naked. Some nights they would leave her on the balcony, no mattress, no blanket, 
and remember that she was kidnapped on the 25th of November, so um, this is the winter and obviously it's very cold. 16 days into this nightmare, one of the boys who raped her and participating in torturing her, not one of the four, one of their friends, uh, he actually felt guilty about what he did and he told his older brother in turn, his brother told their parents, and their parents actually called the police. Two police officers showed up at Minato's house, and they were like, look, we received a call saying that there's a girl here, she's held, you know, captive, and she's being tortured and raped and whatever, so we heard a check. And Minato's parents acted like they had no idea what they were talking about, and they went as far as inviting the men to, to check for themselves. And two police, this was actually enough to discourage them from looking inside. They thought if something this bad was going on in this house, we would not be invited in. So they were like, no, that's fine. We'll take your word for it. Sorry for bothering you. Bye. Can you believe that this could all have ended right there, right then, had they done their job right? This was actually police procedure. They were supposed to go look inside. After 20 days of all this craziness, uh, Junko somehow managed to access the phone and she tried to call the police. But one of the boys, I think it was Miano, he caught her and he hung up the phone. Now, can you imagine Junko's face when that happened? The police called right back and he picked up and he was like, no, that was a mistake. He punished her for trying to escape by pouring lighter fluid on her legs and setting them on fire. At that point, as you can imagine, it's been 20 days of being raped and, and tortured and her legs being set on fire. She could barely walk, she could barely do anything by herself. It's actually a wonder she survived all of this. She had a lot of broken bones, smashed fingers, burns all over her body. It would take her about an hour to get to the bathroom. She could barely eat using her own hands. That is when she was given food. She had suffered so much internal damage that even when she was given food, she could barely keep it down. She wasn't able to digest it. She, she would just throw up. Sometimes Junko would pass out from being kicked and punched so much, at which point the boys would plunge her head in a bucket of cold water to wake her up so they could just keep torturing her. After 30 days of being abused and tormented so much, the extent of the damages on her body made Junko incontinent, meaning that she had no control over her bladder and her bowels. She would just urinate and defecate on herself without being able to control it. Her injuries were never treated, so as you can imagine, some of them got infected. Um, pus and blood would come out of them, as well as a horrible smell. And her face was so bruised and swollen that you could barely recognize her. The boys would actually make fun of her because of that. They would um, tell her that her face was so big, it was so enormous. And all of this actually caused the boys to lose sexual interest in her. And at that point, they kidnapped another girl, a 19-year-old woman, and they raped her, the gang raped her, but they let her go after a few hours. I think for a very long time, Jungo still had the hope that the boys would let her go free. I think she hoped that they were gonna let her go, but at some point she lost all hope and she started begging them to kill her. She was just she she just wanted to be done with it. She wanted to, to die. Just, just kill me already. And she begged them many times, but they always refused and they would just keep raping her and torturing her. On January the 4th, 1989, the boys wanted to play a game of mahjong with Junko. And despite all of her injuries and being starved, she actually beat them at the game. This caused them to get so angry, so mad at her. They started to beat her with an iron barbell. They burned her eyelids with hot wax. They forced her to stand and they started kicking her legs with bamboo sticks and golf clubs. And keep in mind that they burned her legs not too long ago and she hasn't recovered from that yet. She, I don't think she had recovered from anything actually. And from all the injuries she had, pus and blood was coming out of them. Some of the injuries were reopening. In order to not get blood and pus all over themselves, the boys covered their hands with plastic bags so they could continue punching her and beating her. 
Junko started convulsing, but the boys thought that she was faking it. And in order to punish her for faking it, they, again, they poured lighter fluid on her legs, again on her legs, but this time also on her stomach, on her arms, and on her face. They set her on fire, again, when she hadn't even healed from all the other injuries that she had. Junko tried to put out the fire, but she, at some point, she lost consciousness. This last session of punching her and beating her and again setting her on fire lasted for about two hours and Junko actually died. I can't believe that she actually made it this long. She survived. She lived through 44 days of all of this. The boys didn't even realize that she was dead until the next day. It would happen so often that she would pass out after they would beat her that they they just didn't realize. When they finally did, they decided to dispose of her body. They put her in a barrel, they filled it with fresh cement, and they let it sit. I really feel like Junko won the game on purpose. I think she probably knew that it would piss them off. Maybe she was doing that on purpose. Maybe it was her way of having them be so upset that they would beat her even more than usual, even harder than usual. And maybe she was hoping to to die from it. I don't know. I mean, as I was reading all of that, I was just thinking that maybe it was her way to to end this. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the boys. I couldn't find much information anyway. This case is very old. We're going to start with Hiroshi Miyano, who was the leader, the kidnapper, and the one at the origin of this crime. He was born in 1970, so he's only one year older than Junko. He comes from a very dysfunctional family. His parents argued very often. From a very young age, he was very violent. He would fight a lot with classmates, with kids outside. He would steal, he would damage property, and he was a bully. He even started being violent uh, towards his own parents, and they were so hopeless that they went to his school for help. He started practicing judo when he was in middle school, and he was actually very fond of it. But funnily enough, he was being bullied over there by older boys. He started missing school well, he pretty much stopped going to school and he started working. He was dating the sister of one of his friends. I think it was Minato. He actually wanted to marry her, but he wasn't making enough money from his job. So one day he just stopped showing up. And at that point, he joined the Yakuza. He was making money with them by selling fake brand goods, among other things. And around that time, it is said that he started using drugs. Minato's parents, whose house played host to the horror that Junko went through, they were actually in a pretty good situation. The father was a pharmacist, the mother was a nurse. But just like Miyano, Minato was a troublemaker from a very young age. Shoplifting, violence towards classmates, um, rebellious towards his parents and especially his father. And he started missing classes as well. He would also not come home at night um, after school or wherever he was. Nobody really knows what he was doing, but some nights he would just not come home. Now about the parents, I just want to specify one thing. Obviously they knew what was going on under their roof, but they were not home very often. So obviously that gave the boys a big window of opportunity to do most of the torturing and raping while they were absent, while they were working. Ogura's situation is a little bit different. His parents divorced and he lived with his mother and sister. He actually barely saw his father. It is said that Ogura was really good at sports. He really enjoyed uh, sports in general, but at some point he injured himself and he couldn't practice as much. And he just became lazy, not just with sports, but also with school. So unlike the other two, he was not a troublemaker, but he was um, just lazy and he was missing classes a lot. Watanabe's um, parents also divorced when he was very young. His father actually died in a car crash soon after the divorce. This one was also a troublemaker, but not. it was not as bad as Minato and Miyano. It was just like very minor criminal offenses. And same as the others, he started missing school, he got lazy, 
he just lost interest in school. I mean, I guess it makes sense that these three guys would, you know, become friends. About three weeks after Junko's death, Miyano and Ogura were arrested by police for the gang rape of a woman. It was actually the 19-year-old woman that they found one day, that they kidnapped one day uh, and gang raped when they had started losing sexual interest in Junko. The two boys were interrogated in separate rooms and you should know that nine days before the abduction of Junko, there was a double murder. A mother and her son had been murdered in that same area. Just FYI, to this day, these murders remained unsolved. We don't know who's responsible. And for some reason, one of the police officers questioned Miano about it. I really don't know why he did. Maybe he just uh, took a chance. He didn't give any details about the murders. He didn't even specify it was a double murder. He just said something like, it's wrong to kill someone, you know? And Miano, thinking that his friend had confessed about Junko's murder, when really he had not, he told the police officer about Junko because he thought that's what he meant. He told him everything. Now, Imagine the police officer's surprise when, first of all, he's realizing that he's not dealing with a rapist, he's dealing with a rapist and a murderer, and second, he's realizing, you know, the extent of the horror of this crime. The boys indicated to the police officers how and where they disposed of the body. They abandoned the barrel in this location. This is actual footage of the location as it used to be. I mean, you can probably tell just by the image quality. And this is from the documentary I mentioned. Now, this place has been transformed into a park. And you should also know that before all of this happened, Junko actually weighed 51 kilograms. So that's about 112 pounds. When they found her body, she weighed uh, 35 kilograms. So that's uh, 77 pounds. When Junko's parents were informed that, well, first of all, their daughter had died, and second of all, they were given all the details, you know, of the torture and rape, her mother fainted, and she had to be admitted into a psychiatric um, hospital. She, she just had a mental breakdown. All four boys were arrested, and at the time, they were underaged except one. So that's why when you research this case, you will always find like these pictures of, you know, their um, eyes, you know, being um, covered and nobody knew their names. Nobody knew their identity because that's the law in Japan. You have anonymity if you're if you're underage. But this info was leaked to the media because there was one uh, Japanese journalist who, well, he just disagreed with it. He thought that that um, this crime was so horrendous that these people did not deserve to remain anonymous. And I'm pretty sure the entire planet agrees with that. The boys all pleaded guilty to injury that resulted in death and not murder. In July 1990, Miyano uh, was sentenced to 17 years in prison. Minato was sentenced to four to six years. Watanabe was sentenced to three to four years and Ogura was sentenced to eight years. All of them appealed except Ogura and all of them had their sentences raised. You gotta love Japan for that. You remember the um, Twitter killer case? That's the exact same thing that happened to him. I think the judge felt like maybe offended, like insulted, like, oh, you think I can't do my job? Well, I'm gonna show you how well I do my job. I think he might have been um, influenced by the public's opinion because everybody was shocked when they found out the um, sentences were so lenient. It was because they were underage, but I don't know. I think the crime was so gruesome that people just thought, you know, underage or not, they just deserved more, much, much more. Minato's sentence was raised from 17 years to 20 years. He was released in 2009 and he changed his name to Hiroshi Yokoyama. His parents actually had to sell their house because they were required to pay damages to the Furuta family. They had to pay 50 million yen, which is approximately 400,000 US dollars. Minato's sentence was raised from three to four years to five to nine years. Minato actually tried, 
He tried to become a uh, Muay Thai fighter. He really thought he was going to become famous. Well, first of all, he wasn't even that good. And every time he was into a he was in a fight, people recognized him and they would call him Konkri, which in Japanese means concrete. Because this case in Japan is known as the concrete encased high school girl. Watanabe's sentence was raised from three to four years to five to seven years. And I have no more information about that. Like, I don't know what happened to him after this. Ogura was released in 1999. At some point he found a job but then he just stopped going, he stopped working. He went back to work for the Yakuza and he changed his name to Shinsaku Yuzuru. He actually bragged about the murder after his release and he, like many years later, he attempted to kill a man. I don't have details about that because I had one article saying one thing, another article saying another thing, so I don't want to assume which one is right, but I know for a fact that he almost killed someone years after the murder of Junko. A lot of people have speculated that the motive for Miano to do what he did was that he had a big crush on Junko. She denied him and his ego was hurt. Apparently, I found an article that said... There was no mention of that in the court documents. And you should keep in mind that Miano had a history of gang rape. He didn't only gang rape, you know, the 19-year-old, um, you know, sometime when he had Junko over at Minato's house, but he also gang raped a woman before that, before he even kidnapped Junko. And you should know that every, pretty much every article I found on the subject, they mentioned that the reason Miano and Minato were in this area was actually because they were looking for any woman to rob and rape in that area. So it was Junko, but it could easily have been anybody else. I really don't think Miano is the kind of person who's capable of having a crush on someone. I don't think he's capable of having any sorts of feelings for anyone. And from the information I was able to gather on his background, it's pretty obvious that he came from a broken home. He was raised by parents who were just overwhelmed by the violence of their son and they didn't know how to deal with it, how to handle it. He was violent with them. He was violent with pretty much anybody. And I don't actually know how violent he was with his parents. I don't know if it was verbal. I don't know if it was physical. He was just the kind of boy who didn't like being said no to and he was just, he just thought he could get away with everything. He had pretty much so far, he had gang raped someone before Junko. He had kidnapped Junko and she stayed at Minato's house for weeks, for over a month and a half. When they had her, when they held her captive, they also gang raped another woman. So I really think he just had the, you know, the mindset of a person who thinks they can get away with anything. Junko's funeral was held on April the 2nd, 1989, and the next day would have been her first day at work. The um, employer of Junko, the future employer of Junko, he actually presented her parents with the uniform that she would have worn, and that uniform was put into her casket. <laughs> One of her friends from school gave a speech. Um, it's in Japanese. I'm gonna show you the clip, but I'm gonna just voice over what she's actually saying. Junshan, welcome back. I have never dreamed that we would see you again in this way. You must have been in so much pain, so much suffering. The happy we all made for the school festival looked really good on you. We will never forget you. I have heard that the headmaster has presented you with a graduation certificate. So we graduated together, all of us. Junchan, there is no more pain, no more suffering. Please rest in peace. When her friend says the happy we made for the school festival, it actually is spelled H-A-P-P-I. It's a traditional Japanese piece of clothing. 
and it looks like this. So as her friend said in her speech, the headmaster attended the funeral and he presented uh, Junggu's parents with her diploma, with her graduation certificate. I just want to also mention this because it came up in many articles that I found. Apparently there was a famous actress, adult movie actress, who was linked. I mean, it, there was a rumor that she was linked to the Junko Furuta case. Some people have said that she was just dating Miyano, Hiroshi Miyano, but other people say that she was actually involved, like more deeply involved in the cases and she participated maybe in some of the um, torturing. Maybe, maybe not rape, but maybe she participated in the in the torturing of Junko. This was not confirmed and the actress died in 2008. She was aged uh, 36. There was just so many rumors around her and around the case and she was being extorted money from her agency and that was linked to that. She was apparently also linked to the Yakuza. I mean, it was just like a whole mess and because I found it in so many different articles, I just thought I would mention it. I had never heard about it. I mean, heard about it in like YouTube videos of people who covered this uh, story or in a documentary or in, you know, short clips or whatever. I had never heard about this, but I read it like in so many articles. So I just thought I would mention it. And just to give you a few extra clips from the documentary, this is actual footage of the school Junko used to go to. Junko and all the other uh, four boys. I'm sorry if you can hear background noise. I'm actually doing this as a voiceover during the day, so I apologize. Here you also have the uh, reporters interviewing some of the neighbors of the Minatos. I could only make out that they were saying they heard noises, definitely heard noises, coming from the Minato's house. And they heard screams, uh, you know, like banging noises and stuff like that. And that's all I could make out, so I just don't want to invent anything. Here is actually a clip of the meetup. The, there was a like a school gathering. Obviously you can see everybody's super emotional. This is the headmaster of the school. Also very emotional as you can imagine. I don't really know what they were saying. So again, I don't want to assume. I don't want to invent anything. So just showing you the clip. And this is the mother of, I'm pretty sure it's Minato's mother because right before they show this, um, they actually showed the house where everything happened, Minato's house. So I'm pretty sure it's her mother, but it could be the mother of one of the other four boys. Obviously, she's not answering any of the questions of this uh, journalist. And I would have loved to understand what, what he's saying, what he's asking her. And uh, another thing I forgot to mention is that Ogura's mother... She actually went to the cemetery where Junko was buried and she vandalized her grave because she held her responsible for her son going to prison, if you can believe that. The documentary ends with the reporter going to the Furuta family's house. She's going to, you know, ring the doorbell. She's trying to interview them, but they never wanted to talk to the press. Nobody actually really knows what happened to the Furuta family. I'm guessing they moved after that. They probably moved out of uh, Misato. I think that's where they lived. Yeah, Misato. I just want to finish by saying that uh, the police was never able to find any of the Yakuza members who were linked to the Junko Furuta case. And just so you know, uh, the two police officers who went to Minato's house 16 days into Junko being held captive there, um, they were actually fired for not following procedure. I could not find any more information about them, like who they were, and if they were even able to live with themselves after what happened. I personally don't think I would have. It would have taken them like a couple minutes to go in and look, uh, maybe just like 30 seconds even. Japanese apartments are really small, and it was part of their job. I mean, at that point, if, if they had found her, if they had done their job right, she could have survived her injuries. She could have lived. I also found out that this case happened pretty much simultaneously to the Abeg Nagoya murders, which were of similar nature. And they were not the only ones. It was starting to be a recurrent thing in the late 80s. And that caused the juvenile laws in Japan to be seriously questioned. And last thing is that 
For this case, I had to do so much digging and it was really interesting. It was frustrating at times uh, because a lot of articles were in Japanese and they were Google translated, very poorly Google translated. So it was really frustrating. Like sometimes you would see a sentence that made no sense, but you would see this word and it was important and you could tell that the sentence was important and it just meant something so big but you just couldn't make sense of it and it was all very interesting i mean this case is very old there was not as much information as the twitter killer for example this is pretty recent and there's a lot of articles in english and french like in any language it was you know covered worldwide i would say and i did so much digging in fact that i found a comment in one article that was actually in english of a guy who says that he found i think it's minato he found minato's uh twitter account i will put a link in the description box so you can check for yourself the comment is after the article obviously he posted a few of the twitter posts from this account supposedly minato's account he just gave a link to um, I think it's like five or six different posts defending Minato saying he was, you know, innocent. Potentially he's talking about himself because apparently it's, it, it's him. Like he's not saying it on the account, but apparently it's him. So yeah, I just thought I would uh, mention that and I thought I would put the link in my description box if you want to check it out for yourself. And that concludes the tragic, horrific story of Junko Furuta and the 44 days of hell that she had to go through before she died. This was a hard one. I think it's getting harder and harder to have this YouTube channel. <laughs> Couple minutes for the random item review. Uh, tonight it's gonna be a book. I think I did a book before. I don't even remember. It feels like I've had this channel for so long when really it's been well, only four months. Anyway, I don't know if you're familiar with this book. If you're not, I really recommend you read it. As usual, I will be putting a link in the description box if you're interested in purchasing it. If I can make a recommendation, don't read what's on the back cover. Don't read anything about the book. Just buy it. It's not that expensive. Just buy it and read it and tell me what you think about it. It's it's fictional. It's not a true story. And um, I don't want to tell you what it's about because it's such a... A beautiful story I just don't want to tell you if you trust me don't research it just purchase it read it and tell me what you think of it and if you have read it already please don't spoil the comment section just tell me if you've read it or not and tell me if you liked it or not and um, yeah don't spoil it for anyone please as usual um, thank you so much for watching till the end thank you for staying with me I really want to know what you think about this case if you had heard about it before if you had seen the footage that i showed you from the documentary i don't think you have i don't think anyone has unless they speak japanese give me your uh, thoughts about it and if you have any suggestions for next week i haven't decided yet please let me know and as usual i'll see you soon bye mm -hmm.